On this episode of Skeptico, Alex talks with filmmaker and author Oliver Hockenhall about his new documentary, Neurons to Nirvana. Hey, if you ingest psilocybin, it's going to go fire off your brain like crazy. And that's why you're going to have these amazing experiences and these emotions attached to it. And then Nut does this work and he gives people psilocybin and they go under the fMRI. And hey, just the opposite is happening. The brain isn't firing. These areas are dampened, suppressed. This also comes back to refreshes Aldous Huxley's proposition that the brain, if you will, is a dampening device. You can't be open to everything when you have to make sure that you can catch a particular fish or whatever it may be, you know? At the same time, these peak experiences of experiencing all, if you will, or, or the mystical experience is also extremely important for our survival in terms of erasing the importance and the intoxication of the individual as compared to the group. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris, and on this episode of Skeptico, we return to the topic of psychedelics and the psychedelic experience and how that might provide an insight into these larger questions we ask about consciousness. Our guest is extremely well qualified, someone who's dug into this topic in depth over three or four years in compiling a very excellent documentary film that you'll hear about. There's really not much else to say. I think it's all covered in the interview. Let's get right to my dialogue with Oliver Huckenhull. Today we welcome Oliver Huckenhull to Skeptico. Oliver is a documentary filmmaker who's created Neurons to Nirvana, Understanding Psychedelic Medicines, a movie about the use of and issues surrounding using psychedelics as medicine. Oliver, this ought to be a very interesting dialogue. Thanks so much for joining me on Skeptico. Well, thank you very much, Alex, for inviting me. Uh, I just want to introduce the film by suggesting that, uh, or by letting people know that when you make a film that there's there's a lot of people involved. So I I can't take full responsibility for it. I mean, I do take full responsibility for the film, but (laughs) there's so many talents that were involved with it to make this, including the musicians, uh, the cinematographer, the executive producers, and so on. So it's it, it it's a long process to make a film like this, three or four years, with numerous people and people that I forget about, and then I remember and go, "Wow, that person contributed, you know, quite a bit to it." And it, it's just endless, really. It's quite a process. Great. Well, I'm glad you got that out there, and I think that folks will even appreciate that more if they watch the film, more so because it kind of speaks to the quality of the film a bit. There's a lot of people out there, especially nowadays, who make quote-unquote documentary films, and some of them are okay, but they're kind of one-man band kind of things, and they look like it. This is just the opposite in terms of its look. It looks like a very well-made film. It is. It's engaging. It's entertaining. And the content, for anyone who's even remotely interested in these topics, that is psychedelics and the edgy use of psychedelic medicine, how it fits into society, what it might mean in a broader sense. I can't recommend the movie highly enough. It's just really well done. So congratulations on that. And tell us a little bit more about this film, really three to four years in the making. What drove you to make it? Um, it began uh, when I was talking to uh, Mark Akbar. Mark is uh, the director of uh, The Corporation, probably a film that many of your listeners might know about. Uh, right, very yeah. successful, yeah, very successful documentary. And we talked about uh, what would be maybe a, uh, the next film that we could get involved with and uh, felt that the issue uh, of psychedelic medicines, and that's what we're dealing with, the psychedelic medicines, is, or these, these substances as medicines, uh, would be the most uh, viable film in terms of 
uh, releasing suffering uh, in terms of addressing suffering in the world. That it that because of the uh, development and research, current research that's taking place with psychedelics, um, we felt that these these things really needed to be to, to come out more. We needed we we really felt that the research, the science, the medicine. Uh, that has taken place now and that has take that took place very heavily in the 60s as well needed to be uh, revisited. Great. Well, once again, it is a really great movie. But as we talked about in our email exchange, my interest for the most part lies, if you will, on the topics that lie just on the other side of where that movie leaves off. And, and that's not quite accurate because your movie does dip into and touch on some of these issues of consciousness, extended human consciousness, where that might mean, how this might challenge some of the paradigms that we have, but it really stays true to the title and it focuses on the, the medical, uh, pharmacological issues around the use of this. So the approach I really wanted to take in this interview, and I, I hope you're okay with it, and from our email exchange, I think you are, is really honing in on Two questions. What do psychedelics tell us about consciousness? And number two, what are the social and political implications of question number one? That is, how might we explain this war on drugs issue that you kind of touch on in the film if we do come to a different understanding about consciousness? So let me back up there and start with question one. What does neurons to nirvana tell us? What are your conclusions about the nature of consciousness? What do we know about it from our understanding of how psychedelics work? This is a key, this is of course a key a question, and and uh, even though and you're you're very much correct that this is the uh, underlying s stream, if you will, or the or the hidden stream that's involved in the piece, um, and, and dealing with consciousness itself. And so, what what psychedelics do? What you know from my uh, uh, understanding of what some of these research, researchers have have come up with, both in terms of the ex experiential experiences of the people who take psychedelics, as well as the neurological research. And we're talking about people from John Hopkins. We're talking about people from. Um, uh, uh, Purdue University, you know, well-known, uh, well-established, uh, accomplished uh, uh, neurophysio, neuro uh, psychopharmacologists, you know, people who have been working in the field for I don't know, 30, 40 years, you know, and they're telling me that what these things can do is allow for uh, uh, the perception of 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 our unity with all of life. Let's hone in on that for a minute, because as you mentioned, the film features some very top-notch researchers who are talking about peer-reviewed research that has been done in the, under the best controls, published in, like I said, top journals and all that stuff. Talk about David Nutt, if you will, a little bit. He's featured in the film, very highly regarded. What is he, a psychologist, or he's really an MD in the UK? Yeah, um, David He's a neurophysiologist, neuropsychopharmacologist. Um, uh, you know, again, he's very well established. He was the head of the UK uh, uh, Drug Research Institute, or some. I can't remember the exact title of his right, his right. position. But, anyways, you know, highly regarded individual. Uh, and his work with uh, understanding psilocybin uh, under MRI conditions. Uh, revealed that uh, certain areas of the brain uh, dealing with uh, uh, identity issues. Let me jump in there and tell me, tell me if I'm wrong, but what's amazing about his research is it's completely counterintuitive in that there's two sides to this debate about what consciousness is. One is this idea is that, hey, consciousness is purely a product of the brain, and your brain produces consciousness, and it just kind of secretes it out, and there you go. And there's this other model that's less popular, but really has some real intellectual force behind it. And it says, no, conscious is more like something that's out there, and your brain is this transceiver that brings it in. So 
what people would have expected, the kind of status quo mind equals brain scientists would have expected is, hey, if you ingest psilocybin, it's going to go fire off your brain like crazy. And that's why you're going to have these amazing experiences and these emotions attached to it. We know what that's like. That's a brain that's just firing off like crazy. And then Nut does this work and he gives people psilocybin and they go under the fMRI and hey, just the opposite is happening. The brain isn't firing. These areas are dampened, suppressed, which completely right. supports right. this other model that this consciousness is flowing in and what the brain is doing is kind of regulating it. And if you turn that regulator down, you get like a full dose of this consciousness. And that's what it means to be tripping on psilocybin. And I don't know which side is right, but that's kind of where the debate has wound up, right? Well, yeah, I think that it, this also comes back to or reveals or or refreshes Aldous Huxley's proposition that the mind is, or the brain, if you will, is a dampening device. Now, uh, basically designed for survival usage, you know, so that, you know, you can't be open to everything when you have to make sure that you, uh, you know, can catch a particular fish or whatever it may be, you know, so you're not, you're right. not open to the buzzing confusion, the endless uh, amount of information that is accessible to you, because it would be a, a, of survival, it wouldn't be of survival benefit. At the same time, these peak experiences of experiencing all if you will or or the mystical experience is also extremely important for our survival in in terms of uh uh er erasing if you will the importance and the intoxication of of the individual as compared to the group hmm. so that if we become more associated with group consciousness with the consciousness of of all our relations, as the native people say, uh, that you know that, that we are all connected to the plants, to the water, to the animals, to each other. Then we see each other as brothers. So it is a mystical experience. It, we are talking about an experience that places us within uh, an associative in into the associative web of life itself. Fascinating. That's really interesting. I hadn't quite thought of it in exactly that way. Tell me this, from your work and from what we find in the movie, how would you say the researchers you talk to are divided on this issue? You said something there that's really kind of neat and I can really kind of wrap my arms around, but your, your movie doesn't come across as being that much in the camp of the expanded view of consciousness. I, I, and that's not a negative. It just says you're kind of just reporting the research and it's kind of coming through as, hey, we're not sure this is it, but we definitely need to use this as medicine. Uh, tell me how you suss that out in your own way. I mean, the, the step that we take initially to saying, okay, there's some therapeutic medical advantages to this we must seize right away. And then this broader implication kind of idea that you have? I approach this film in terms of relieving my own suffering and to attempt to uh, assist in the relieving of suffering of others. Now, uh, you know, in some ways, as an example, when we talk about something like MDMA, um, it's being abused by many, many people. At the same time, it can be used very, very potently within a therapeutic setting that would allow people to touch into their own heart. Now, how does it do that? Scientifically, it's revealed, as an example, that, um, that it relieves uh, uh, certain kinds of tensions within the amygdala, which is a center in the brain that deals with emotional uh, trauma, right? That, that that area in the brain has that, you know, it, it deals, it, it will, it, it, it will be marked uh, uh, in terms of post-traumatic stress disorder. And in some ways, if you really look at our society, you can say that all of us have suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. When I was growing up, you know, uh, nuclear bombs are about to drop all the time, right? I mean, I was lived through the Cold War. So, you know, th th there's a kind of continuum of trauma that we've all experienced. And there's, there's, there, are, there are medicines out there that will uh, connect us profoundly to who we are, to the heart within us, uh, relieve fear, right? Relieve fear. And fear in the Indian tradition, fear is when there, there, there's a quote from or a line within one of the Hindu scriptures that suggests that 
when there is another, that is when fear begins. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is something that in our society that promote so importantly the idea of the individual uh, as compared to our relationship our relationship and the importance of our of our care for one another it is quite prominent in our society great so w- what i hear you saying oliver and this then syncs up with what i saw in the movie is you can be agnostic if you will about this issue of consciousness and still approach and say gee there's all these people who are suffering for example in the united states so many people who are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder after their tours in Iraq and Afghanistan and all these other quote-unquote wars. And we can purely approach it if we want from a materialistic brain-based standpoint and say, here's this drug, MDMA, ecstasy, and under the proper controlled clinical therapeutic environment, it just seems to be efficacious for the result that we've been trying to get for these people all along in that we want to help them move on with their life and integrate in these traumas that they've had. And we don't have to go any further than to just look at, doesn't that work? And shouldn't we make that available to people? Yeah, absolutely. It, it is a, that practical. It is a practical film in that way. And I'm very happy that it is in that direction. At the same time, there are moments within the film that either through visuals or through uh, narration that uh, explicate uh, the, this issue of consciousness that we're, we're examining. Well, let's jump from there then to question number two, because I think the the little dialogue we've had so far kind of plays out this story in my mind of a, just a fascinating issue. It's like, okay, so we, we don't have to go there in order to see that some of the laws and, and regulations we have surrounding the use of these important medicines are, are antiquated, are, are, are really injuring people or, or not helping people that, that could be helped, right? So we can get there through your film. But then don't we have to ask the second part of that question, which is, why is it like that? Is there another reason that we have to consider for maybe why these laws are the way they are? Why this culture of war on drugs and that your consciousness needs to be controlled and all the rest of that? Why we've gone down that path? I'm sure you've thought about that a lot personally. I don't know that your film addresses it directly, but I'd be really curious as to what you think about that. Do you think there's an underlying motive, either directly or indirectly, in our culture's war on drugs? Well, I, I appreciate what you're saying here, and I, I agree with you. I do think that uh, I do think that's mostly indirected, and it's it has to do with fear. Uh, again, it has to do with fear of one's own mind. Um, the more, and it's you know, if we even even if we look at this idea of uh, the conservative brain and the liberal brain, you know, there's been some discussion and research in that direction, uh, and it suggests that uh, certain brain structures are, are are not willing to to take any risk in their not lives. They're not willing to to expand outside of uh, their framework. So the, the more creative, and and clearly as a society, we need to be more. creative. Creative. We need to embrace uh, uh, each other and embrace our own creativity. And uh, these substances, uh, again, positioned properly uh, within a cultural uh, tradition that respects what these states of mind are about and what they can give to us uh, and what they mean. These 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 things can be uh, powerful allies. Now. What's happened in the past and what's happening now is that uh, uh, this war on drugs relates to a kind of uh, oppression and suppression of the possibilities of, of consciousness itself. People in power, people who, you know, it's a bad thing to uh, allow the kids to have all the colors, to have all the color pencils in front of them. It's, it is a way of control. It's, it's a way of uh, disallowing the possibilities of, of one's own mind. At the same time, I understand why that that has happened in the past, because, you know, people can abuse these things. And it's true, they can, uh, but they can abuse anything. It's it, they're very powerful medicines. We should be looking to cultures, as example, the Native American culture, who have been using peyote, as example, for 5000 years. Right. 
when they do it in ceremony, it's it's very much a, a gathering that is very sacred, that respects everyone, that uh, deals with these issues, but in a very elegant and complete manner. So how do you deal with these ultimate states of consciousness? If you, don't, if you do it without respect, then you're just entertaining yourself, you know, and people do that too, you know, which is uh, kind of unfortunate because uh, even though I think that it's fine to uh, engage occasionally in a in in a less than um, ceremonial setting, I think that if you're going if you're going to f- f- fully benefit from the experience, it should be within community and within within a support structure that recognizes the potential, the symbolics, the the metaphysics, the metaphors, the mythic level of consciousness that one gets into with these substances, and uh, navigates all of that. I agree with that. At the same time, what I appreciated about your movie is your movie doesn't say that as much or doesn't say that directly. Instead, it says something I think very powerful in that let's start with the therapeutic model as a way of understanding how we might integrate that in. And then we have therapists who come on and say, you know, the use of this drug is all about setting. It's all about context as well as it's about the biochemical reaction. And I think that speaks to some of the issues that you're talking about, but does it in just a really pragmatic medical way that everyone can understand and feel comfortable with? Great. Yes. Thank you. I think that that's true. I think that we've managed to do that. And and again, I really want to emphasize the importance of all of the people that were involved with the film and, and uh, uh, give them thanks and gratitude. But let me circle back, if I can, Oliver, to a little bit more on the political side, social side, because I think we're kind of coming at this from a very similar way and and you kind of creeped up there and said hey you know if you really were interested in controlling large masses of people and you were interested in controlling them for the reason that you wanted to protect them and at the same time protect your own interest then it's not really in your interest to run out to have people run out there and explore their individual or group consciousness you know you'd really prefer to have them kind of more in this fear-based, consumer-based mode. I mean, that's much more malleable. And at the same time, what you would do, and again, I would suggest this is exactly what we've seen, you'd want to take those medicines yourself and explore how to use those, how to weaponize those, and you might want to do something like Project MK Ultra, and you want to give them to people under the worst conditions in the worst context and try and really warp their brain and twist their brain and see what you want to do. I mean, don't we have to face that that is what we would expect a government to do, a controlling entity to do, and that that's the best evidence we have for exactly what has happened? Yeah, I, I think uh, some of your uh, listeners may be interested in Jay Stevens' LSD in the American Dream. It's called Storming Heaven. And it's an excellent book about uh, psychedelics during the 60s and the involvement of the CIA and so on. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's a fascinating read. Um, and I do believe, yes, uh, you know, that, that, that what you're, you know, some aspects of what you're saying, I certainly agree with. I think that... Um, I think at the same time, you know, it's it's important for us to not be too conspiratorial about this, in, in my opinion, because there's such a flexibility as an example uh, or malleability within this whole world, if you will. Um, uh, so even though, uh, you know, I, I do believe that there's a number of people that were that that were involved with LSD in the CIA who became very um who became a little bit different than the rest of their fellow uh, workers because of their experiences. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't have any examples in front of me, but they got turned on and, and probably dropped out as well. It's not all black and white. Sure. No, certainly. And again, your movie is evidence of that in that you see all these folks who have a sincere interest in helping people, as you said, removing, relieving suffering. And uh, I, I think that's just a wonderful place to start because it, it, we can certainly build consensus around that and build consensus around the, the, the medical use of these drugs. Which one of these uh, drugs, these substances, 
did you learn the most about in terms of making this movie and the medical uses of it? It's a difficult question. It's actually impossible to answer because they are, they, they are each unique in their own way. Right. And at the same time, one of the, the one of the substances that I didn't examine in the film because it's positioned within the Native American community is peyote. Well, I just want to pay homage, if you will, to that community uh, because they've been dealing with, they've been traumatized to such an extent. And at the same time, it's such an amazing community and such an amazing culture. Uh, you know, if we if we really look at what it means to be a North American, it means to be at least to know of the of that beauty of that uh, of the Native American culture. Um, and uh, they were involved with peyote for five thousand seven hundred years. So you know, we're talking about a long history of uh, medicinal use, sacred use of a plant. We should at least touch on the substances that you do cover in the movie, and each of these is covered in depth, both in terms of its um, their medical uses and some of the issues surrounding them legally. LSD, psilocybin, MDMA, also known as ecstasy, ayahuasca, and cannabis, of course. Cannabis was the one that kind of surprised me the most. I, I guess I learned some things about the medical uses of, uh, of cannabis and marijuana that I, that I wasn't aware of. I found it really interesting because I think that I think that uh, the war on drugs uh, from the sixties and seventies um, and to today as well, of course, today as well, yeah. But the, but the beginning of it uh, was related to a lot related to the youth movement of the sixties. So you know when people were starting to smoke marijuana, it was kind of like a a refusal of the gin and tonic and the and the scotch and and water. Uh, you know, you can tell a lot about a culture by the drugs it approves. And those, the, the youth embracing marijuana uh, was related to, first of all, it's a lot easier on the body than alcohol. It gets you into a state of mind that is uh, much more compatible to being at ease in the world. And, and it definitely can be medicinal. So at that moment, the, the, you know, the youth movement in the 60s against the war, against the Vietnam War, which is, which is covered somewhat in the film, um, it was related to the use of something like marijuana. And uh, I think that the youth embraced these drugs because they wanted to, because they realized there was something wrong with our society, deadly wrong with it. And they wanted to have conscious experiences that were, were definitely outside of the box of uh, daddy's uh, liquor cabinet. And, you know, we're, we're, we're still dealing with that. We're still dealing with, you know, the, the choices that are made about where you, where you want your brain to go, where you want your consciousness to go. Um, and some people still obviously are frightened about a certain kind of ease as compared to the the harshness that that is often attached to i mean you, you know you never hear about someone or rarely hear about someone uh hurting someone under the use of cannabis while alcohol obviously it's both a depressant and seems to encourage uh violent activity from a certain group of people you know one final question for you oliver let me kind of take it out there a little bit but this is a topic that has been touched on by several different folks uh when i had Rick Strassman, who, of course, wrote The Spirit Molecule into his research into DMT, but also mm. in the book by Graham Hancock lately. And that is this idea that there are spirit entities associated with these substances. Now, that may sound way out there for some folks, but we have to realize that the conversation that we've had is really a precursor to that. If we free ourselves from this materialistic explanation that consciousness is purely a product of the brain, and we just follow the data, like the data you have in your movie, to get there, and we say, wow, that really seems to be it, then we might have to be open for this spirit world, and we might have to then take seriously, at least into consideration, whether there are spirits associated with these substances. Do you have any opinion or thoughts on that or even how to approach a question like that? No, thank you. I, I, I think it's a really important question. I, th I think that if you appreciate, as an example, the ideas of Joseph Campbell 
if you uh, appreciate the ideas of someone like Wade Davis, uh, the, these are uh, anthropologists and, re- and uh, story researchers, people who have studied mythology and so on. What we can ascertain and what I personally have ascertained is that uh, there are levels of consciousness that reveal to us that we are not alone. These entities that are much larger than us, as an example, water itself. Like, I mean, if you really thought about it, like, what, what the hell is water? You know, you, if, if, you, if you can set yourself within in what would be called in the Western mind, the poetic frame of mind, you'll see that the world is a magical a uh, full place, full of entities, full of powers, and that, and and again, if you want to go go further in that idea, if you want to go, you know, wilder, that it doesn't really make sense to me that any advanced civilization would be rocketing from one place to another, right? That seems like it would be a kind of archaic way of getting around when you could do it through the mind, and in my opinion, the this world is full of of who knows what. I think that I think that we're that it's so interconnected. I think that all the universe is so interconnected that um, you know the aliens are us. And uh, by approaching it that way, when it's not relying on a kind of fear base. Oh my God, there's scary things out there. You're approaching it like, oh, I'm one of these scary things. I am one of these aliens. I am uh, 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 an entity. And it gives you power, too. And I think that that's a good thing. That is a good thing. Uh, Again, the movie is Neurons to Nirvana, Understanding Psychedelic Medicines. Oliver, tell folks where they can find the movie, how the movie's going. It's screening all over the world. There's a number of places... Uh, including tonight at San Francisco at Landmark Theater. Uh, I think it was about three days ago. It was in Chicago at the Landmark. We've got screenings happening in Helsinki, Ibiza, London. You know, it's it's really getting out there. You can also go to neuronstonirvana.com where you can download uh, the whole movie or you can order a DVD at the same URL. Great. Well, again, it's a film that I think anyone who has even a, a slight interest in this topic will really, really find interesting, and I do hope they check it out. Oliver, best of luck with it, and again, thanks so much for joining me on Skeptico. It's, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks again to Oliver Huckenhull for joining me today on Skeptico. I do have one question that I'd throw out there as a result of this interview, and it really has to do with the second question that I asked Oliver. And that is, what do you suppose the connection might be, if there is one at all, between government or social influencers or the people in charge or whatever you want to talk about it? What do you think the connection might be between those folks and our public policy position regarding consciousness expanding substances? Now, I know many of you aren't as open to conspiratorial threads as I am. I see them everywhere because in my experience, wherever there's money and or power, there's a conspiracy. But leaving that aside, what are your thoughts about the possible connection between the war on drugs policy and a population that's seeking to expand its consciousness through the use of these medicines, chemicals, substances, whatever you want to call them. So chew on that for a while and share with me your thoughts. A couple of places to do that, either in the comment section of the Skeptico website or for a more in-depth discussion, you might want to pop on over to the Skeptico forum. You can find both through the Skeptico website at skeptico.com. You'll also find links to all our previous shows, all available for download for free. So do check that out. I have a number of interesting shows coming up. I have a couple of shows of a more experiential nature where I've gone out and done some things and I'm reporting back on them, but I'm kind of waiting for those to get resolved more fully before I share them with you. And in the meantime, I have a couple of other I think very interesting shows coming up. So do stick with me for all of that. And until next time, take care and bye for now.